So welcome everybody to our family hymn evening this evening and our discussion about uh, First Kings, second part of First Kings. And thanks to Carl for organizing our discussion tonight and turn time over to you. Thank you, sir. Well, here's the topics for tonight. We're gonna to do a quick review. We're gonna talk about the big split, Elijah and the widow, Jezebel, and let's get ready to rumble. Uh, the still small voice is still small, and the king's wine. Those are my topics for tonight, plus whatever else you guys want to talk about. So let's do the review. What what do you see in this picture? Oh, this is the oh, this is uh, Solomon deciding uh, whose child, uh, whose uh, mother the child belongs to. Yeah, Solomon spirit. was extremely wise, and he got. How did he get so wise? Do you remember? Uh, well, it was a blessing, wasn't it? It was like, I think it was a gift of the spirit almost. Yeah, the Lord asked him to pick something that he wanted. And instead of picking something for himself, he decided to pick wisdom so okay. that he could judge Israel well. And then the Lord blessed him with a whole bunch of other stuff because he picked the right thing, door number one. However, in the later years, Solomon kind of slid. According to Kings 11.1, 1, he loved many strange women. Funny how all these women look European. Yeah. Must be uh, the, paint, the painter's selection. Anyway, so he slid down a little bit. And then the Lord says, maybe so we could get you to read verse 9 for us. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And so he commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. And Rod, if you could do the next one. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. A couple of things that I noticed in this particular reading. Number one, in verse 9, it said that the Lord appeared unto Solomon twice. And where much is given, of course, much is expected. And yeah. so the Lord truly expected him to stay true, but he didn't. Under the influence of his many wives, he began to seek other gods, and he didn't stay 100% with the Lord. I don't think he ever abandoned Jehovah. However, he just wasn't 100 percent anymore. And so the Lord said that he would rend the kingdom and he would give it to his servant. So we'll talk about that a little bit in this week's reading. Then at the very end of, of Kings 11, we meet this character named Jeroboam, who then runs into the prophet who rends his garment and tears it into 12 pieces. And then he says to Jeroboam, you can have 10 of these pieces of this garment symbolizing that one day he would lead the 10 tribes. So we have this split in the kingdom and it's a very significant split between the two tribes in the south, Judah, and the 10 tribes in the north, Israel. Why is it significant that they split? What do we know about the 10 tribes in the north? They were lost later on. Yeah, they become the 10 lost tribes. Oh, that, yes. Yeah, so that becomes a, a significant. They, they get taken away by Assyria more than 100 years before Judah. And one of the reasons that they get taken away is they basically have about 20 kings. But Israel in the north has zero, I repeat, zero good kings. <laughs> None of them are righteous. And down in the south in Judah, they have about one in three or one in four that are kind of righteous. And so they hang on for a little bit longer. What do you think these two little other pictures to the side of the center picture represent? The cartoons? Yeah, the little cartoons, what do they represent? Any idea? Well, the one on the right, money. This explains why the kingdom split. There was an issue of taxation. Oh, right, it was the taxes. That's right, yeah, right, they, that's right. They asked Rehoboam not to tax him as hard as Solomon did. And he said, no, I'll tax you harder. Yeah, so he, he consulted two groups of people. He consulted the old people who said, yeah, if you treat the people nice, then they'll be with you forever. And then he consulted the guys of his periods, the guys he grew up with, and they said, no, no, no. 
we need to tax them harder. And so he listened to the younger generation instead of the older generation, and he increased the taxes. And the net result of that was this Jeroboam. You know, who was this Jeroboam guy and what can we learn about him? Well, he was the son of, of uh, Nebat, who was from the tribe of Ephraim. And when he was quite young, the previous king, King Solomon, made him a superintendent in building a fortress and doing some other public works. And so he became very knowledgeable about the widespread discontent that the people had over the high taxes. Why do you think Solomon had such high taxes? Well, he, he spent a lot of money. Well, did it have to do with the temple? Yeah, he did build the temple and that did. And so after the temple was done, they figured taxes would go down, but they he had, didn't. He had 700 wives. And 300 concubines, if you believe yeah, exactly yeah. what they say. So he had quite a large household and that, that, that brings a big bill. Oh, so, but, he also, but he also built a huge house for himself. Yeah. And, and that place that he entertained in, it was even bigger than the temple. Yeah, it was twice as large as the temple. So he spent probably more money on those. He led a very extravagant lifestyle. And then influenced by the words of a prophet, Jeroboam began to form some conspiracies with the view of becoming king of the 10 northern tribes. But when this was discovered, he had to flee into Egypt where the Pharaoh there protected him until the death of Solomon. So when Solomon dies, then he returns and he participates in this delegation where they're asking for the king to reduce the taxes. And after that idea is rejected, then they proclaim him the king of the northern kingdom. Now, the northern kingdom is sometimes called Israel. It's sometimes called Samaria and is sometimes called Ephraim. The, the real name was Israel, but Samaria was the capital and Ephraim was the tribe that led it. And so the only two tribes that were left in the south were Judah and Benjamin. And you remember that Benjamin was a very, very tiny tribe. Because right, and wasn't, and wasn't Ephraim just, it was, it was a very large tribe in comparison to the others too. That was part of it. That's correct. If you remember, Jeroboam was simply a servant. And so he was elevated from being the servant by the voice of the people to become the king of the larger kingdom. The working man's king. The working man's king, yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Elijah. Now, it's very interesting because one of the most famous prophets in the Old Testament is Elijah and all the miracles that he did. But he came along just at the right time when was perhaps the, the time when the kings were the most wicked. And the kingdom, especially in the north, was having some severe problems. So let's just talk a little bit about Elijah. He had the sealing power. And so he sealed up the heavens. Do you remember how long they went without rain? In one place, it says three years. In another place, it says three and a half. So somewhere north of three years. And not only was there not any rain, there was not any dew. Now, dew was really important to Israel because it was all along the coast there. There's a lot of water. And so uh, particularly in some places, there was heavy dew. And so even if there wasn't rain, the dew would allow you to grow crops. And if you remember from uh, some weeks ago, there are certain parts of, of Judah that needed to have at least nine inches of rain. If they didn't get nine inches of rain, they didn't get any crops. That's quite a bit of rain, actually. Well, nine, nine inches of rain over a whole year is not. But normally what happened is they get it during three months in the wet season. And then that was enough for the whole time. Elijah was told during this drought to leave Israel because he'd been preaching to all the people in Israel in the northern kingdom and he was go told to go into this place near uh, Sidon that was Phoenician so he's told to leave Israel and to go among the pagan people and when he's there he meets who a widow the widow mm -hmm. and what do we know about the widow well we know that she was on her last bit of food or and she had a son she had a son and she was preparing their last meal before because her resources had run out right we don't know how long it was into the drought but obviously enough that she had no more substance but i have to say that um what was 
asked of her, she did without question. Huge amount of faith. Yes. Yeah, it would be tough. Okay, here, here she is. She's got a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. She only needs two sticks. And then, you know, for you, those of you who are campers, you're not building much of a fire with two sticks. And so she doesn't have a lot of food. And then he asks her first to get him some water. And then as she's going to get him the water, which is a reasonable request, he probably just walked out of the desert. Then he asks for a little bit of food. Now that would have been her last meal. And you know, some people were suggesting as I was listening to different podcasts and reading this week, that she probably wasn't even going to prepare that meal for herself. She was probably going to give it to her son. She would probably just have said, you eat it. But he asked for it. And so he does give it to her. And then he, the prophet gives her a promise. What's the promise? That her, she basically would want for nothing, nothing like she would always have food. And that's exactly what happened. Every time she went to the cruise of oil, there was oil. Every time she went to the little pitcher that held her flour, there was enough flour for one more meal. And so she lasted for the rest of the drought in that way. But then to add insult to injury, what happens? Her son dies. Her son dies. Second dies. Now, you have to question, what was the Lord thinking? <laughs> she's a widow. She's lost her husband. It's a drought condition. She's almost out of food. She takes in a border because Elijah stays with her. And then her son dies. And, and she's not an Israelite. That's what's and she's not even an Israelite. She's, she's a worship. We're not even sure. Although she does know about Jehovah because she at one time says your God speaking to Elijah. And so she's aware of, of uh, Jehovah and she, she has some faith because a prophet asks her to do stuff. And then she does stuff, even though a regular person would probably not, and certainly not an Israelite wouldn't probably help them. Yeah. She was being more faithful than, than the yeah. Israelites. So, okay, why, why? Well, faith precedes the miracle. Okay. Yeah, in the end, it's a happy ending because Elijah raises him from the dead. But, you know, what's that famous statement from Joseph Smith? The, the religion that doesn't require anything of you? The Lord pushes you as far as you need to go. And so, obviously, the Lord saw something here and pushed her hard. And I think sometimes we think, you know, we're going to live a righteous life and everything's going to be honky dory. It's all going to be good. She, I mean, she, was, she was blessed. Her and her son did survive the, the rest of the famine. And of course, we don't know what happened after that. So. We don't. But nevertheless, I think there's, a, there's a, a lesson to be learned here that even though we're living right and we're doing the right things, the Lord doesn't promise that it's always going to be easy. Okay. Now we get to talk about Jezebel. Betty Davis. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I had to dig up some movies here for you. This, this is more a tribute to my mom who liked old movies. The name Jezebel today has actually a, a different connotation than the actual type of person that she was. Not that she was a, she was a terrible person, but it, it's developed into a more a Hollywood style these days and, and deals more with a woman who's trying to tempt you versus what she really was. So let's just talk about for her for a bit. She was a Phoenician queen, uh, sorry, a princess, and she married the king of Israel, Ahab. And the royal Phoenician women at this time were very active in temple roles. And so she would have been a priestess of Baal, actually of the female counterpart, not the male part. And she instituted the worship of Baal on a national scale. And beyond that, she purged all of Israel of the prophets who believed in Jehovah. So she kind of swept clean through northern Israel and started promoting the Phoenician gods, the Canaanite gods. And so she was a real piece of work. It's, it kind of sounds like what happened in, in medieval England when, when the different king or queen took over that was in a different church and then they wiped out. Protestant versus Catholic, yeah. Exactly. So let's just look at Elijah. Elijah gets to be the prophet at the time that he's opposite Jezebel. The name Elijah means my God is Jehovah. 
And then the name Jezebel means Baal exalts. And so we can see that this is a real head-to-head -head contest. This is Jehovah against Baal. And so we have this contest that happens, this contest between Elijah and Jehovah and the priests of Baal. Do you remember the story? Yeah, they have a contest to see who can call down the fire of... Why, why, did, why are they having a contest? What, what's the main point behind this, which is the top picture? Well, it, it has to do with their gods. It, um, Elijah wanted to prove to these priests that there's only one God. So he challenged them, right? He challenged them to but see the if whole they bring down their God. Is that there's been a drought for however many years. And this is because Elijah sealed the heavens because the people are worshiping false gods. And so his thinking was, if we give a drought, the people will repent and come back to Jehovah. But they didn't. Three years later. <laughs> because Jezebel's indoctrination of the people has been so effective and so intense that they're holding fast to Baal. And so he says, all right, here's two Bullocks. Let's have a contest. He says, you guys go first. And they do their thing they build their altar and they put the wood on they're not allowed to light it they have to call down fire from heaven and he starts to mock them i mean this is he disses them really badly you know he's not answering maybe he's talking to somebody else you know he could be sleeping he's having a bathroom break it doesn't actually say that in the scriptures but there's an idiom there that means he's on a bathroom break maybe he can't hear you you need to shout louder He's out for a walk. He, he just really taunts them. And they go on about it from early in the morning all the way to the afternoon, late afternoon, early evening, which is the traditional time for sacrificing in Israel. And so then he does his thing. And they start cutting themselves even. It's weird. Oh, yeah. That was a very uh, a deep tradition, a Canaanite tradition that was prohibited among the Hebrews to cut themselves. Elijah is a bit of a showboat. <laughs> You know, he digs a trough around, he, he drenches it with water, 12 barrels of water. And this at a time when there's been no rain for however many years. Doesn't tell us where he got the water from. But this was a huge symbolic act. And then, of course, when he kneels down, we get the lightning show and the whole thing is dissolved. The wood, the water, the rocks, the dust, everything is sucked up. And so then the people began, of course, to recognize that Jehovah is the only true God. And it turns them back for a time. However, Jezebel's not very happy because it's kind of ruined her whole program. So Elijah has to flee and he disappears. He goes away goes far away into the area around where Moses got the Ten Commandments. And then we have this very, very famous story of him on the mountains. And Rob, maybe we could have you read this for us. There are two ways an individual can hear the word of the Lord. He can hear the earthquake, uh, the wind and the fire, or he can hear the still small voice. Obviously, the wicked choose to hear the word of the Lord through the violence of the elements especially prior to the second coming the wicked will hear the voice of the lord from the testimony of earthquakes that shall cause groanings in the midst of her and from the testimony of the voice of the thunder and the voice of lightnings and the voice of tempest the voice of the waves of the sea heaving themselves beyond their bounds idiot that is one way to hear the voice of the Lord. Latter-day Saints should be familiar enough with the spiritual things that they can recognize the still small voice. Elaman heard the voice. It was not a voice of thunder. Neither was it a voice of great tumultuous noise. But behold, it was a still small. It was a still voice of perfect mildness as it had been a whisper, as if it had been a whisper. And it did pierce even to the very soul Sometimes members of the church want something more. For them, the still small voice isn't enough. And this continues. The First Presidency in Nauvoo warned that those who wanted more, the Lord cannot always be known by the thunder of his voice, by the display of his glory, 
or by the manifestation of his power. And those that are the most anxious to see these things are the least prepared to meet them. And were the Lord to manifest his power as he did to the children of Israel, such characters would be the first to say, let not the Lord speak anymore, lest we, his people, die. So the Lord gives you a couple of choices. You can listen to the still small voice, or you can wait for the big show. And we're seeing that more and more throughout the world today. There's wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, volcanoes, all kinds of testimonies that the Lord is not happy. Okay, let's go back to uh, King Ahab and Jezebel. Incidentally, this, this marriage that he was able to contract with the Phoenician king for Jezebel would have been a big coup for him, would have been a treaty that would have been very, very powerful because the Phoenicians, I don't know if you know anything about the Phoenicians. Phoenicians were originally a Canaanite group. They were there from the beginning, but they spread all the way over to Carthage, over to Spain. They, they become a seafaring people. And it's through them that the alphabet actually gets the Phoenician alphabet turns into the Greek alphabet and then into the Roman alphabet, and it gets spread all through the Mediterranean. They were a very powerful force at the time, or became such. Anyway, this marriage was very interesting. Two extremely wicked people. Now, one day, the king comes home, and he's kind of pouting and whining, and the queen wants to know why he's so upset. And he's upset because he wanted this really beautiful vineyard that was very productive that was right near where his house was where the castle was and it belongs to somebody named Naboth and he tried to buy it off of him he offered him twice as much money as what it was worth and the guy said no I can't sell it to you it's it's my ancestral property what does that mean do you remember passed down from generation to generation yeah and and it was illegal to sell it all right you're not allowed to sell it. And even if you do sell it or mortgage it in the Jubilee year, which is every 50th year, it has to revert back to your family. So anybody who bought it only really was getting it for short term. Well, yeah, I mean, they could have it for 49 years, but regardless, it was never a long term purchase. And so he's explaining to the king, I can't, it's my ancestral home. And according to the Mosaic law, I can't sell it. You know, even if something were to happen and I had to sell it, then it has to come back to the family in the Jubilee year. And then he goes back and talks to the queen and he's moping at home and the queen says, I can fix this. And so she begins spreading slander around about how bad Naboth is and he's a blasphemer. And then she hires two guys to testify against him and then the people stone him and then he dies. And so then the king's able to pick up this piece of property quite cheap because the owner's dead. So that kind of gives you a feel for what Jezebel was like, you know, and that was her idea. She, she had the brilliant idea of making her husband happy to be able to get him this vineyard. So we've talked about her purging all the Israelite prophets. There was one of their servants who was in charge of their home, whose name was Obadiah. And he was a very faithful member. And he protects 100 of the prophets and hides them in a cave and feeds them. And so I don't want you to think that everybody in the north was wicked because there were people that were still believers that still wanted to be faithful. He was right there under the king and the queen's nose, you know, saving people left, right, and center. Uh, we talked about the mount on the challenge on Mount Caramel. Of course, these 850 prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth are then killed. And so Jezebel's really upset. She wiped out her whole community. And so she swears to kill Elijah, who has to flee. And then we talked about the vineyard and the entrapment and execution. And then eventually Ahab dies. And then the queen dies, her death by defenestration. Anybody know what that is? See, this is where I was so happy that I went on my mission to Italy so I could understand a little bit of Latin. Fenestra is a window. Defenestration means to be hucked out the window. And so she, she dies by being thrown by the eunuchs out the window. And so she meets a gruesome death, all of which was prophesied. So not a very nice lady. In any case, I'm going to jump ahead here. 
to Amos 8, 11. And maybe Sue, you can read that for us. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. I thought that was an appropriate scripture this week because of the three-year famine. And the fact that, you know, it took them the big show in order for them to realize that it wasn't just a lack of rain and a lack of food and a lack of water, but they lacked the spirituality to follow the Savior. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago in April 2020, the prophet gave us a talk in general conference called Hear Him, and he outlined ways that we can hear him. He said we can go to the scriptures and hear him. We can hear him in the temple. And the temple is kind of a special place because I think the Lord listens more intently when we're praying from the temple. We can hear him as we heed the words of the prophets and seers and revelators. We also hear him more clearly as we refine our ability to recognize the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. It has never been more imperative to know how the Spirit speaks to you than right now. I renew my plea for you to do whatever it takes to increase your spiritual capacity to receive personal revelation. This has a, been a big message of the prophet, and I think of most of the conferences in the last few years. You remember the famous quote that he said that in this time period that we live, we need to absolutely understand how to hear him, hear the Savior, because if we don't, we're not going to survive. And so I, I echo that message that we need to hear him. We need to read our scriptures, do the Come Follow Me program, get to the temple as often as we can, read the words of the prophets, seers, and revelators, and refine our ability to listen to the still small voice. And that's really what I learned this week. Having said that, I'll turn the time back over to Rod. Okay, thanks, Carl. And unless anybody else have any closing comments, I um, really appreciate that, Carl. It was a really good reminder of things that, that yeah, we need to be remembering, certainly having the Savior Center in our lives.